We'll just put that up on the screen. My webcam has just stopped working like two minutes before this, but that's okay. Um, doesn't matter. And uh, someone's asking about a hum. I think it's my um, air conditioning because it's like 95 degrees outside right now. And the mic is actually on a stand. <laughs> but uh, welcome everybody. This is week number 30 for Life From Lockdown. I know that is absolutely crazy. We've been doing this for 30 weeks. Um, now I'm just going to give you a night an, an announcement here. Um, we're not going to have Life From Lockdown for the next two weeks. Now just relax. It's okay. Um, so basically we are ending season one on week 30, but I'm actually going to be doing live streams next week, two live streams from Adobe, um, on Wednesday and Thursday. So join me for an hour and a half each day where I'm going to be doing compositing. And that's a big reason of really why we're not doing that. Plus design cuts next Thursday. Uh, if you guys haven't signed up on the mailing list at photoshopcafe.com, sign up on there and I'll give you guys the times. I'll let you know what's going on. But the week after that, and here's a big reason why we are not doing another Live From Lockdown, it's Adobe Max. And Adobe Max is going to be live this year online, and it's free. So we've got a whole week of education, and um, I encourage you guys really to, to join up on there and attend that. It's amazing. Normally, it's an expensive event, like $1,600, um, and it's going to be an amazing uh, virtual event with all the sp same speakers, same sessions, um, and I've been working very, very hard on my sessions. It's, it's really going to be good. So I'm going to be presenting three times at max. It's going to be Tuesday, the 20th, Wednesday and Thursday. So Tuesday, I'm going to be on at 3 PM Pacific time. Wednesday is going to be 3:30, and Thursday. It's going to be 2:30. Now that's where we're going to be live. I'm going to be doing a three part, uh, lab on compositing. So you're going to get the video of uh, creating this composite and also I've got a written workbook. So you're also going to get all the notes and the lesson files to follow along with. It's going to be really massively cool. Um, so for the next two weeks, you guys are actually going to be getting me three times a week. So that's also a good reason to take a week off or two weeks off from life from lockdown because speaking live four times a week <laughs> would be a lot. But we're going to continue again on the 29th. Mark your calendars, October the 29th at our regular time at 1 p.m. We're going to be starting season two of Live From Lockdown. And, you know, we'll see what we can do to make it as good, if not even better. And I'm actually working on some things to make it even better than season one. So... Um, for those of you who have joined us for all 30 weeks, thank you. Um, a lot of you guys have. And as I say, you know, the next two weeks are going to be amazing. And then season two is going to be awesome. So, um, you know, I'm going to see plenty of you guys. <laughs> I'm not really going to be going anywhere. I'll be around. So, um, so what we're going to do this week, because of, you know, just everything, I figured we're going to do another super special of Fix My Photo and we're going to have a look at your guys' photos. So why don't we just get rolling right now. And here we are on Fix My Photo. So even though we're not starting the next one, it's going to be three weeks away. Submit your photos for the next one. Um, you can submit those photos to fixmyphoto.net. Upload raw files if you can. If you only have a JPEG, make sure they're at least 2,000 pixels so I can do something with them. Also, um, I prefer them unedited. Put your name in a file name so we can shout you out and let everyone know it's you. And a maximum of three submissions per week. So each week you can submit three, but don't flood us with photos each week. Um, so here we are, and I'm in Adobe Bridge right now. And here is this week's submissions. We can see we've got quite a few here. And um, we've got some great ones. And so I've, I've just been kind of looking at these. Some of these we're going to look at doing some fixes. Some of these we're going to be doing some, you know, some challenging things. And we're going to be enhancing too. And congratulations on Connie. Uh, I think you broke the three rule, but I'll let it slip this time. Um, obviously a family event and I am going to say, I think it's the baby's christening. Um, I'm pretty sure it's not the wedding. So <laughs> there we go. So, um, we'll, we'll look at, um, one of those in a little bit. So why don't we start with something that's just kind of nice and just kind of fun and then we'll work up to something more difficult. So, 
Um, and by the way, once again, if you guys have questions, feel free to drop those questions in there. Uh, welcome to use you guys who just joined us right now. We're going to be jumping in. And also just to let you know, um, we will just tear through this. And then at the end, um, we'll do questions and answers uh, where we do specifically questions. And that's our Live From Lockdown or LFL um, Afterglow. So we'll do that at the end where we just kind of hang out and socialize, do questions and answers and all that fun stuff. And if you do have questions as we're going, feel free to drop them in there. All right. So why don't we have a look here and just see what we've got. Um, it looks like Rod Shelley here has submitted a couple. Let us know where this is. And it uh, looks like he's been shooting something with his drone here. This is his DJI drone. And I'm wondering which one should we look at, guys? Should we do this one or this one? So that's number one or number two. Let me know what you guys think would be a good one to look at. Um, and what did I just hit the escape key? So just to let you know, I'm here in Adobe Bridge. And if I right click on any of these, um, I can take them into Photoshop, which is where we go. Okay, so we've got two votes for one. Okay, one, everyone's saying one. Let's go with one. So what I'm gonna do is make sure I remove any adjustments. See that little icon there? That tells us that adjustments have been made to the photo. So I'm gonna right click. And what we're gonna do is go down to develop settings and then choose to clear the settings. Notice that puts it back to how it was shot. And to answer the question about the microphone, I have it on a stand, which is not touching anything, but it does seem to go through. So I'll look maybe for next season at getting a shock mount for the mic so it doesn't pick up those vibrations. All right, so let's right click here and we're gonna choose to, let's open it in Camera Raw. All right, so here we are inside of Camera Raw, which comes with Photoshop. And for those of you who are using Lightroom, the settings are identical in Lightroom as they are inside of Camera Raw. So it's the same processing engine and Camera Raw comes with Photoshop. Okay, so the first thing we wanna do is we wanna do the profile correction, which um, I believe is already applied, but let's go down and have a look under here, under geometry and optics. We're gonna pop those open and you'll see this option that says use profile correction. Watch the photo when I click on it, boom. See how it gets rid of that warping? So this is an FC350, I forget what that is. Is that a Phantom 3? Phantom 3 Pro maybe? Um, let us know, Rod. And I forget what these numbers are, you know, off by heart. But when you turn on the profile correction, you should be doing that with any photo. What it does is it looks there, it sees what camera was used, which was a DJI, it's an Inspire one. Okay, there we go. Um, and, it's, and so we're using an Inspire one, and then it's using the profile for that lens. So that's the lens profile for that camera. All right. Um, and Rod's there and he says, got a few tears, uh, shot a few before it became so restrained. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that's uh, Inspire One drone. There we go. Yes, and is that the standard camera on there? Um, yes, it is. Okay, so basically when we choose the lens profile, it'll you can choose the camera if it doesn't appear. So this is not just for drones, it'll work for everything drones, GoPros, you know, your Canon, Nikon, Sony, Panasonic, all your cameras will be supported. And you can go under the make, choose the model of the camera and the lens you're using. And that will automatically get rid of warping and also work with vignetting around the edges. Let's see if this has much. Turn it off and turn it on. A little bit of vignetting, not, not too much going on, but definitely some fisheye because that's a wide lens. Um, 3.6 millimeter, which is the equivalent of, let us know, is that like a 30 mil or something? 22 mil, I forget. All right, so that's the first place to go. And let's go up under our adjustments and we're gonna go to the basic. Now, one of the things that the DJI profile tends to do is it tends to push the contrast a little heavy. So let's take the contrast and just pull it back a little bit. See, it makes it, the photo look a less dense. Um, one of the mistakes a lot of people do is they have this contrast turned up really high and it chokes the photograph. Um, you know, so what we want to do is just pull it back a little bit, let it open and see just it feels a little softer, a little smoother. And what it's doing is allowing more dynamic range to show through. Okay, so now we're going to take the highlights. We're going to recover these. Don't worry if the photo gets dim. I want to push these back because what I'm looking for right now is to get as much detail here in the clouds as I can. So we want to get this kind of coming out here. And uh, Rod's saying this is known as the castle. 
All right, so let's open up our shadows a little bit. Now be careful with this. If you go too far, see how it can just start to look a little fake. Uh, but sometimes, you know, especially with trees, I like to open up just enough so we can start to get some color here in the uh, in the trees. And, um, you know, just overall, that's a good start right there. What we're going to do now is maybe get a little punch of vibrance just to kind of make these colors pop a little bit more. And one of the things I like to do on these types of photos, especially the drone shots, is to push the temperature up a little bit just to warm it up. Because these drones tend to shoot just a little bit cool. All right, now if we look at what we've done before, there's the starting image and there's the after image. So you can see that we're starting to see more detail and stuff here. Now maybe we want to bring out a little bit more detail here in the texture, but I don't necessarily want to bring it out in the trees. Because what happens sometimes is people bring out too much texture in the trees and they start to sizzle. And when I say sizzle, that means they get white around the edges they get these little halos around the edges and you lose detail it's not really attractive all right so why don't we go down we're going to grab our brush here let's grab our adjustment brush with our brush selected we've got the mask options on we've got auto mask turned on let's see how this works and i just want to paint over these bricks so i'm just kind of selecting the bricks here in the castle and don't worry about these areas too much. It's more the flat surfaces. We want to try and bring out some of the detail and maybe a little bit on the ground here. Let's just go there. Great. Turn off the mask options. And now we're just looking at it. And then why don't we go down here and we're going to make this texture pop. See what we can do there. Increase the texture. And now we're making the texture of the bricks stand out a little bit more without sizzling the trees. And let's give just a touch of clarity. It's looking pretty good. And what I might do here too is let's give it a little bit, let's warm that up even a little bit more. Give it a little punch of contrast, recover those highlights. And what we're trying to do here is give it a little shadow. Let's just bring out some of that brickwork. There we go. So we're bringing out that brickwork. Now just make sure it's matching the overall scene. I feel like I need to turn up the exposure just a little bit to match. There we go. And now if we look at this before and after, you can see how we're really making the brickwork pop. Now if you feel like it's a little too colorful, you can pull back a little on the vibrance if you want or the saturation. Um, but let's just go up to the top here. I'm kind of liking that. One of the other things I'd like to do to this here is... Let's go down. It's looking pretty good. I'm looking at the horizon here. It's pretty straight. It's looking nice. Okay, good. All right, why don't we bring this into Photoshop and then in Photoshop, we're going to do a little bit of work. So where we go to open, instead of just choosing open, hold down the shift key and it'll change to open object. So now this is going to open it inside of Photoshop, but it's going to open it as a smart object. And the reason I wanted to open it as a smart object is in case we want to go back into those settings that we changed in Camera Raw. Watch this. Double click on the thumbnail and it goes back into Camera Raw. See? So now we have the ability to do a full round trip in Camera Raw. So this is nice. So this means, you know, if we want to play around, pop the vibrance a little bit, pull the saturation down, we can do that now. Another thing that I like to do on these types of images is let's go down to the color mixer. And what can happen sometimes, and uh, particularly these drones, is the greens um, can sometimes get a little too orange and the yellows can also get a little too orange. So let's have a look under the hue. Notice I'm in the last option. We can choose here which hue, which is the color. We can choose the saturation, how much of the color. Or the luminance is how light or dark it is underneath each one of these colors. And all just gives us all of those settings in one just kind of super panel. All right, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to look at the oranges and let's see what happens if we push those towards the reds or the yellows. See how we can just kind of shift those colors a little bit? Let's do the same things with the yellows. See how we can just go in there, watch the greens. If you want to make those greens more yellow, you go that way. You want to make them more green, go the other way. So see how we can go in here and you can just fine tune the colors in the image. 
Now, this is changing the colors, so maybe that green, if you go there and you're like, whoa, it's too much green, we can go down to the saturation and pull the saturation back a little bit. And see what we're doing is we're making them a deeper green now without losing that saturation. So this is kind of how you can go through and play around with the different colors. I'm going to reduce the saturation a little bit on the orange and maybe give it a little kick in the reds and a little kick in the yellows. And we're just playing around here with these colors. All right. So let's have a look and see what we did here since we came in. There's the before and there's the after. I'm liking that. Let's click OK and we're going to go in. Now, there's a lot of different things we could do with this image. Let me just twirl this open a little bit. Gives it a little bit more space since my face is not visible this week. There we go. And, you know, we could sharpen it. Let me show you how to sharpen this. Let's just duplicate the layer. And what we're going to do is a high pass sharpening effect. So with this sharpening applied, I'm going to choose to go under the... And notice we're working with smart objects. So I'm going to change this to the overlay blending mode. And then I'm going to go down to filter other. And we're going to choose high pass. This is known as high pass sharpening. And this is a non-destructive way of sharpening images. There it is with no sharpening. And, you know, we can go ridiculous with it, which we're not going to do. But we're going to take it just a little bit. But this form of sharpening here uh, just brings out a lot of the detail. Let me double click, get to 100%. Maybe that's too much. There it is before and after. Definitely too much. So let's um, just double click on here. We can go back into the setting. And let's pull it down. So when you sharpen or do noise reduction, you want to be doing this at 100% magnification. There we go. And then you can see what's really happening. So if we look at that before, well, actually, it's a whole high pass. Let me apply it here. Before, after. So now we're bringing out some nice texture there in the bricks without sizzling it. So that's kind of uh, one of the images there. Now, there's other things you could do, of course. You know, we could do dodging and burning and all kinds of things, which I sometimes will do with my um, aerial pictures. Uh, let me show you a little trick. Something I do sometimes as well is I do a double processing with Camera Raw. So I'm going to select both those layers. Shift, Option, Command, and that Shift, Alt, Control on Windows, and then hit E, and that's going to give us a merged layer on top. But this has all the adjustments. And then so sometimes I'll do this and then I'll go back into Camera Raw again. And, you know, if you want to get a little bit more dramatic, notice it zeroes out all these sliders because we're starting at zero. And that gives me more highlight recovery available. More shadow recovery. See that? And so we can go in here and we can give this a second pass. And just really just kick up some of the... Um, some of the adjustments see that see what we're doing here and so it's it's just basically doing a double processing effect and this works a lot when your skies are very bright and you want to recover more detail out of those skies um so then we're just going to just uh, maybe we'll put a vignette around it just for fun so let's go down here we're going to choose effects and with the vignette we're just going to pull it down and it's just going to see what it does it just kind of darkens those edges and it's bringing attention here into this castle. Boom. There we go. And uh, that's that's our adjustment. All right. So that's the first one. Let's go back to bridge. And let's look at some other ones. One of the ones here I thought was... Uh, let's open this up. Jill. So either someone tipped an ice cream or a soda over her head. Or she went swimming right after dyeing her hair. So I would suggest don't go swimming right after you dye your hair. That would be the easy way to fix this. Um, but let's have a look and see how would we go in here and how would we fix something like this? So there's two steps. The first step is going to minimize it. And the second step, I'll show you how to get rid of it. All right, so let's go in here and I'm going to go under the adjustments and we're going to choose a hue saturation adjustment and this is a way to remove you know just little things of anything in this case you know it's dying you know on her back running down her back or as i said someone you know tipped a drink over her head um 
So what we're going to do here is we're going to grab this little tool and let's zoom into 100. So let's zoom right in so we can see the color. And with this tool here inside of the hue saturation, we're going to click in that pink color. Notice this clamps around that area. So now I'm going to change it to something just absurd so we can see it easily. And so now what I want to do is I'm going to adjust this and see how much of this we can get to pick up that crazy green color. See that? And now we're picking up the color here, which is just on that liquid. So let me zoom out. And so what we want to do now is we obviously don't want to do that crazy hue color. But maybe we can take the saturation down a little bit. Maybe take the lightness up a little. And so what we're doing right now is we're just reducing this. Now this is not going to completely get rid of it, but it's definitely um, making it a little bit better. Let me put the layers over here. There's before and after. Okay, a little less obvious. And you would just paint around the hair to make sure you can keep the color in the hair. Let's do that right now. I'm just going to grab a black brush. And so with the layer mask selected on the hue saturation, make sure black is your foreground color, grab a brush, and you can just paint on the areas that you don't want to change. Great. We're getting there. All right. So what we want to do now is we want to get rid of these big droplets. See, the little droplets are fine. It's the big droplets that are now an issue. Okay, so why don't we go in here and we're just going to create a new layer in the layers panel drag that layer to the top and then we're going to go down now to our healing brush don't use the spot healing because the spot healing samples randomly we're going to choose the healing so we can control where we are sampling from because i noticed there's plenty of areas of clean skin here so under the layers make sure you choose all layers because if you don't nothing's going to happen if you choose a current layer because it's a blank layer and this way we can clone or heal non-destructively on a brand new layer. If you don't get anything else out of this, that's what, what you should learn. All right, so here we go. We're just gonna hit the Alt or the Option key and we're gonna sample a good clean area and then just paint over the area that we wanna get rid of. As simple as that. And all we're doing is we're just gonna keep repeating this and a nice thing about it, as we do this, it also starts to give us a nice area that we can sample. See what we're doing? We're starting from here and just kind of working out and giving ourselves a good clean area. And as we go, it actually gets easier because it's easier to sample because we've got more areas that are that don't have those drops. And so what we're doing is we're just going over here sampling areas that would be kind of similar and now if I was using the spot healing it would be a little more random with the healing brush see I can target those areas I want to get and if you wanted more droplets you could target those droplets and actually clone those on there too and a lot of the time you know when you're doing with this you know whether it's something like this may as well get rid of that um, you know or you're doing pimples even a heavily pimpled face um, or you're removing tattoos or anything like that, what you do is you just start, hit those big areas, and then just keep going. And so what will happen sometimes is, um, you know, you just kind of do it in passes. So you might not get a perfect, but if you think about like this, this philosophy, right? So if you start with it and there's just splashes everywhere, it's, it's really hard. And say we haven't finished yet, and you're looking and say, well, it's not perfect. Yeah, but this was what it was like before. This is what it's like after. So imagine starting with this. You'd be like, oh, man, you know, because maybe some little areas here. Well, just go in and get them. No big deal. Just make it larger. Um, and, you know, and also you can play around with this diffusion. Watch this. If I turn the diffusion low, watch what happens. So see here, that's better. See how it was kind of looking a little weird here? with that lower diffusion. See how we're fixing that now? So just fix one problem at a time. If it leaves a weird mark, just 
just go back and fix the weird mark afterwards, but let's start with trying to get rid of the issues of the color. And there we go, you know, we're just kind of going through here. I think you guys get the idea. And we just keep going, keep going, keep going. I'm probably not going to do the whole back because I think you guys get the idea now. And, you know, up here, same thing. You just you're just cloning the same thing. So let's look at this. You know, here's this where we started. Then we went in here, reduced the colors, and then started cloning. And you know, you could play around two more of these colors and try to get it closer to the skin tone if you were worried about those areas. But honestly, you can just heal it. You know, you might not even have to remove those colors. But removing those colors just kind of means you don't have to get so many of those spots. All right. Um. Could you change the color and make them look like water? Yeah, I'm sure you could. You know, you could just go in here and just say, okay, what color have we got there and apply it. You know, it, it, you know that's all you would need to do. Just, you know, apply around the hue saturation. It's going to be kind of hard to do that, though, to be honest. You know, if we look at that water here, you know, maybe reduce that saturation. Yeah, hang on, make sure we're on the right layer. Not selecting that right. Oh, I turned off the thing. Okay, so you had to do it when that was on. So we'd have to reselect it and then just do that and just play around. Maybe a little bit more lightness, less saturation. And you could probably get pretty close and also just change the hue. If you move that hue when I had those areas selected, you know, you could adjust that hue. Obviously now it's too late because I've, I've gone further. But yeah, you could do that. Or I think sometimes it'd be easier just to get rid of them all and then just copy more water on if you wanted more water there. Uh, the difference between the clone and the spot healing. Well, let me show you guys, since we're here, let me show you the different tools, what they would do. So if I'm here, right now I'm using the healing brush. If I change to the spot healing, turn on sample all layers. Now let's just create a new layer on top. Let's hide this. So we're just going with the spot healing. This is what we get the spot healing. You go like this and it's quick, it's super quick. Um, actually it's working really well. Sometimes the spot healing though will sample a bad area, but you know what? In this case, spot healing is working great. Look at that. Boom, boom, boom. Very fast. So what happens with the spot healing brush is it automatically samples where it's going to be grabbing from. And I guess for things like this, it works really well. Now, if you were trying to do things like the hair, you know, you could get some really weird things going on here. Because it just randomly selects. Um, but, you know what? It does a really good job. Alright, so spot healing works good. Okay, so the difference between these and the clone stamp tool is with the clone stamp tool here, um, what the clone stamp does is it paints this area in. It doesn't blend it in. It just paints it in. So it's got a soft edge, which is why it looks like it's working nicely. If I take a hard edge, you can see what it's doing. See how it leaves those marks around there? And it just blends in because I'm using that soft edge here. And so, clone stamp works very well, works great. And a clone stamp works if there's something you particularly want to get. Say for example, I wanted to put this drop over here I could do that see that with the clone stamp you can literally clone things so a, a clone stamp is very literal but it doesn't blend it in the healing brush blends everything in and you choose where you want to sample from and the spot healing brush automatically samples and you know what I'll be honest I think the spot healing did the best job although it did leave a few spots that's with the spot actually no no yep that's it yeah, see how the spot healing didn't leave even tones? And then notice here, that's the healing where I chose the sample areas. Yeah, there's a little issue there. See that? It's leaving spots because it's sampling randomly. So some of these areas are brighter or darker, whereas when I was sampling myself, now that I look at it, I think the result's better because I was able to choose more consistent tones. So it's a little bit of harder work, uh, gives you a better result. The easiest one to use, of course, is spot healing. But as you can see there, 
it gives us some weird coloring you know so use that only on like more even colored tones so all right that was fun uh, there's a little question here is the spot healing brush like the content of where somewhere close to the area brush yeah yeah pretty much um you're right patch tool is um you know just very much like works the same way you know so let me let, that was a good question here when you're asking about the content aware let me make a selection around there and then you shift here and then the content aware is here yeah you're right the content aware is just going to be like a massive spot healing brush the patch tool is kind of like that but you're doing a larger area um so let's go down here maybe i should do a whole session some some point just on these different uh, tools and then so the patch tool enables us to sample a well that's horrible a larger area and we can just kind of move it and blend it with something that looks similar and release it and that'll kind of go in there now there's different modes of working with this that is under normal content aware is going to be better Okay, so let's do this now with content aware on and watch what happens. Yeah, it's not bad. It's not fantastic either. Um, so yeah, I think the uh, healing brush definitely worked the best on this. And just experiment and you'll find that, you know, some tools will work for better. The patch tool works really good when there's objects in a photo that you don't want. You know, works really good for, you know, like as a, you know, something like this maybe you know so you know that works good for things like that or modifiers when you're shooting you're doing a studio shot and you get your reflector in the shot or your light gets in the shot this is where the patch tool is good for those kind of things all right so we're just kind of looking at some of those maybe we'll do more retouching if that's what you guys want to see later on I'm going to do one of these since Connie was... Are you here, Connie? Say hello if you are. And um, if not, speak now or forever hold your peace, Connie. <laughs> I'm going to show you a couple of things here. Um, why don't we grab this one and this one? Because these are common problems that you guys are going to see in photos all the time. So I'm just going to choose here. We're going to open them in Camera Raw. And let me just click there. All right, so this one here is very common when you get things like this, where you get the uh, coloring. Um, notice, you know, we get this warm tone. It happens a lot into a stuff, uh, particularly, you know, with those types of lights, you know, the uh, tungsten lights. You can go and you can change the color under the basic panel. Just change this to something like um, tungsten. And that's a little cool, but see how the colors are definitely more natural. I'm going to go back to as shot. And one of the other ways to work, and it works really well, is to just grab this little eyedropper. And then what you're looking for is something that's white. I don't know what color this wall was originally, but I do know that the baby's outfit here or the socks would definitely be white. Don't do the bottom of a baby's socks because they're never going to be white. Although on christening day, I'm sure, or baptism day, I'm sure it is, um, but let's click on the sock here and on the edge and see what we can do. And see how that neutralizes the color cast? The other thing we can do is we could do the little outfit here. And, uh, you know, and notice that gets rid of that. Looking at the histogram, it's empty here it means we need more in the highlights. So let's open up the exposure a little bit. We can do that. Let's take the highlights to the left, shadows to the right. Maybe warm it up just a little bit, even though we did neutralize it. It's just nice on skin tones. And we can look at something like this, you know, before and after. It's a very, very common um, problem to solve. And um, and if you're watching the replay, Connie, uh, congratulations. I'm sure it's, a, you know, it's obviously it's a big family event. Big deal for the family here. All right. So um, shot like this, you're going to see these kind of things shot in direct sunlight. Um, you know, there's not, nothing you can do to... Do this except maybe sometimes in a situation like this you would try to stand in some open shade or something like that but the nice thing about the shadow and the highlight is that we can recover these a little bit by taking that highlight and the shadow and notice what it's doing is it's recovering 
a lot of that detail. So this is how we're combating harsh light. And now we can play around with that exposure. And I'm going to warm up that color temperature just a little touch here. And now we can push some blacks in here. Because if it feels like it's getting too washed out, let's push those blacks in. Give those whites a little touch. I'm not going to touch the clarity on this. I'm going to give a little bit of vibrance. One of the things that's kind of uncanny that you wouldn't expect is if you look at a bright day, um, you know, direct sunlight compared to more overcast. And the more overcast, when you capture something, you're actually going to see more saturation in these colors because that bright light's not blowing out the color. So let's have a look and see. This is where we were before, and there we are after. And if you feel like it was just a little too strong on the shadows, just pull it back a little bit. But you can see how this really just kind of recovers this, this a little bit and helps us to um, to get this to get this going right. Or use a built really big gobo, as um, Rod was saying. Yeah, that's that's a good idea. You know, some kind of diffusion. All right, so we're just going to click on done, and I think we've done a couple of those family shots. We got those nice. Now I'm going to show you something interesting. If we're here, whoops, let's go down here. I'm going to show you how to replicate adjustments inside of Camera Raw without uh, inside of Bridge, sorry, without even having to open Photoshop. So there's that picture that we adjusted, right? And if we look at the one next to it, notice it's a very similar picture. But we, there, there's the original. This is what it looked like without the adjustments. Rather than go through and have to do those adjustments again, I can click on the image that we've adjusted inside of Bridge, right click, go down to Develop Settings, and choose to copy the settings. Let's double click on this. Oh, I didn't want to open this, so it said Cancel. Let's stay in there. I wanted to make that larger. I have to slide it here. When I'm in camera raw, I double click to make it larger. Okay, so there's the picture here. This is the second picture. Watch what happens if I right click. Let's do it on the edge so you guys can see the picture. Develop settings. And now we can just choose paste settings. We can choose what to add. Let's just click OK. And boom, look at that. I've applied those adjustments from camera raw to another raw photo without even having to open Photoshop or Camera Raw or Lightroom or anything. We can do it from Bridge. And the reason is because of this metadata. So when you're working with a raw file, when you make the adjustments, all you're doing is changing the metadata. So when you look at a photo, you know, there's a metadata, just a text sheet that says brightness equals zero, saturation equals zero. You copy that, you know, you make the adjustment, it changes that brightness to 20 or that saturation of 40. And then all you're doing is saying to this photo, make the brightness 20, saturation 40, or whatever any of the adjustments were, and then it duplicates it. Nice thing about this, a couple of things, I'm going to give you a couple of tips here. If you have shot a whole folder of photos, a thousand photos, or a hundred photos, you can select those photos, right click and copy, and these adjustments will ripple through all of those photos. So that's a really, really fast way of making those changes. Another thing, sensor dust. Have you guys ever got sensor dust? I know I have. Um, or, you know, just a little dust or speckle on your lens, something like that. Uh, if I see any of you privately over drinks, I have a great story about a very well-known person in the industry and dirty lenses that I won't share that publicly, but it's a great story. If you ever catch me, I'll be happy to share that story. All right, so what you would do if you've got sensor dust is you would go in here, you would grab this. Well, I don't think we do, but let's have a look. Let's see if we do have any sensor dust. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go down to our spot removal. And you see this option that says visualize spots. Turn that on and play around. And we might have a spot of sensor dust here and we might have some there. Let's turn off visualize spots. And let's see. Yep, we got sensor dust. Uh, let me make this 100%. Hit the space bar and I can pull it down. There's a spot. All right, so we got that. You know, it's probably not on the sensor. It's probably just on the lens. Um, so to get rid of that, what you would do is you just tap here with our spot tool. 
Okay, so now I'm just going to click Done. So what this does is it doesn't open a photo or anything. It just updates the settings here inside a bridge. Now, if I right click and I choose Develop Settings, Copy Settings, and then I select every single photograph that I've shot on this camera this day, whether it's inside, outside, it doesn't matter. Every horizontal shot, I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna choose develop settings. This is a really useful, and then we're gonna choose to paste settings. And then we're gonna check none to turn off everything. So nothing is being adjusted now. And then just turn on just by removal, click okay. And what it will do is it will apply that adjustment and get rid of that spot, that sensor dust on every single photo because that's not gonna move. So when you get that spot on your lens or your sensor, that's gonna be in the same spot on all the photos. And in fact, why don't we open this and have a look and see if it worked. Let's go down to our adjustment brush here, turn it on and look at that. That's the one we applied it to. There's the adjustment. Notice it got rid of that sensor dust on this other photo. So that's a super useful tip uh, for batching that, you know, cause if you've ever done that, which I have, and then, you know, you come back and it just seems like I get dust every time. And as Rod Shelley says, a dollar for every time, I would have made thousands of dollars, millions of dollars. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's laborious to go through and remove them. So just batch process them like that. So hopefully that was a useful tip and uh, that'll save you guys a little bit of time in the future. All right, let's see what else we've got here. We've got some more photos here. Looking through these, we've got all kinds of interesting photos. Oh, David, got a lizard there. Um, he's got some zebra. Um, just looking for something that might be some fun here. We've got the stream here. Donald Haynes. Okay, why don't we have a look at Donald's shot? So we look at it before. Notice he got rid of a couple of things because I'm going to do the one. There's the one he adjusted. And he got rid of these uh, little issues. What he does have here is a little bit of what I was talking about is some of these, uh, the foliage here is starting to sizzle just a little bit. So why don't we have a look at this? And we're gonna double click on his before image and we're gonna pop this open. Are you here, Donald? Say hello if you are, oh, there you are. Uh, this will work very well with your drone. Good to see you. And uh, we're gonna play around with one of your images right now. So what we're going to do, oops, oh, we have some camera shake here. How slow is the shutter speed on this? 180th of a second at 105 mils. That's why you've got camera shake. Um, so you want to be shooting faster than that. So there's a little rule that you want to double. I'm sure you guys have heard this. So you want to double your focal length. So if you're shooting at 105 mil, you want to be shooting at least one two hundredth of a second in order to minimize that shutter. If you were shooting at 24, you would only have to shoot one fiftieth. So here's one eightieth, which is less than that. And then you're going to get that camera shake, which is handheld. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that rule. If not, I'll say it once more. If we look at the focal length, this is a 24 to 105 lens. And he was shooting at 105 mil, which is a zoom. He's zoomed in. And when you zoom in, you really, it's difficult to hold it steady with your hands. The further you zoom in, the harder it is, as you probably found if you hold a 200 mil handheld, very hard to get a clean shot without camera shake. Um, if you're shooting wide, it's not difficult at all. And the reason for that is you want to double your focal length. So if you're shooting at 105, you're looking at 210 as double. So you can just round it up to one two hundredth of a second shutter speed. Right now he's shooting at one eightieth of a second, which is almost half the required speed in order to get rid of camera shake. Now he might have been a maximum for this lens at an F4. So one of the ways you could get around that, of course, is to speed up that shutter speed. In order to do that, you need more light. So the F4 might be the maximum for this particular camera. But in this case, with the ISO 400, this is a Canon 5D Mark III. You could have taken this to ISO 4, 800, no problem. So if you'd taken this ISO 800, you wouldn't be getting noise on the Mark III. And then 
that would allow you to double this to 1 1 60th. And at 1 1 60th, you probably wouldn't get camera shake. Just uh, bringing that up there. So when we zoom in, that's why this is a little soft and blurry. All right, so let's continue here with this uh, healing brush. We have two options. We can heal and clone. So we're just going to choose heal and see what happens. Boom, got rid of that. And let's um, just click back on there. And we want to get rid of this bottle floating or whatever it is, animal, whatever it is. And we're just going to paint that out. Same thing, just use that tool there, just very quick. And this is in camera raw works the same way in Lightroom. And notice what it does is this automatically creates a selection. So here's a tip. Notice that we are seeing doubling because this object here is showing there. If you don't like where it automatically selects, choose the forward slash key. Each time you do, it's going to sample from a different area. And I like that sample better. And by the way, that's what the spot healing brush does, is it samples exactly what you saw here. That's how it works. Except you can't resample it um, like you can using the healing brush inside of Camera Raw. All right, so let's go ahead and do some adjustments. I'm just going to do my basic adjustments that I do to almost any photo on this one right now. Let's just start from the top, work our way down, color temperature. Let's warm it up a little bit. See how that just makes it look more inviting. And I just love this. I'm, whenever I see green, I want to give it that nice, a little bit more yellow, warm it up, give it that really just nice uh, shire kind of look. So we just, you know, I always warm up the grass. All right, so we're looking at exposure. Histogram here looks like it's a little dark. Notice everything's pushed to the left. Let's pull it up a little bit more. Don't take it too far. Even though the histogram will let me push it all the way here, that's too bright. So I'm gonna take it, just eyeballing it. Let's recover our highlights. A lot of the time, I'll just automatically push this way all the way to the left. Gives a little bit more to play with. If our exposure, take that contrast down a touch. Open up the shadows just a little. All right, so now we've opened this up. We've got a lot of dynamic range here. It feels like it's just a little too lacking, a little washed out, so we're going to do our whites and blacks. Look on the histogram here. If I hold down the Alt or the Option key and I grab the white, I can pull this up and we can see where it starts to clip. See where those artifacts appear? That means it's clipping. So if I go back to about here, there's no clipping. But it doesn't mean you're going to go there. You might want to go a little less because you're eyeballing this. Because I felt like there was too much white in this area. It wasn't looking good. So I'm pulling it back. Now let's do the same thing with the blacks. Notice we're getting clipping there already in those trees. And it might not be a bad thing. Just putting a little bit more body into that picture. I'm going to take it to about there. Let's have a look and see where we are before and after. We can see a big difference. And notice I haven't touched the texture, the clarity, the dehaze, or the sharpening yet. And we're bringing out the detail using the tones. One of the things that a lot of people do is they want to bring out detail so they sharpen the photo. Or they reach for clarity. And watch what happens when I push that clarity up. See? We're starting to get... It starts to sizzle. Those leaves sizzle. Because what it's doing is it's increased in contrast. Clarity does this very quickly. See, it makes the bright white immediately, makes the blacks black. And then it clips, loses the color in those areas. So when I say sizzle, it takes those areas of fine color and just forces them to black or white. And it sucks the color out of the photo. Um, so just be very careful with that. You could give it a little texture. Maybe a little bit of texture. You know what, we're going to do this because of the focusing issues on here. But notice I'm going subtle. We're giving it some texture there, a little bit of clarity. Let's give it a kick of vibrance, give it a little bit more color. And let's look at this before and after. I like that. I'm going to click Done. And let's compare. Um, you know, and I'm not obviously not trying to compete with you or, or anything like that. I think Donald understands what I'm teaching here. Um, so there's Donald's adjustment. And I like the deep greens. We could go with those deep greens. This is nice. But see how you got that sizzling here on the bank? And you've got the sizzling there where the highlight areas are blowing out. And see how here we're not? And it's maintaining a little bit more even color here. 
And I understand why you probably sharpened it a little bit more because of the focusing issues. Um, so, you know, it kind of makes sense there. Um, so hopefully um, this kind of helps uh, there, Donald. Um, hopefully this helps a little bit. All right, so that's how, you know, I would uh, fix a photo. And I hope you don't, certainly don't take this as, as a criticism because it's not. It's a beautiful photo. Um, just, you know, just trying to help. All right, so let's see what else we can do here. Definitely see the sizzling. I'll be more aware of that. Great. That's awesome. Because I, I see a lot of people do that, and they have just these amazing photos, and just that sizzling, it just can give it away sometimes. Julie Boyle. These are wonderful photos. Look what Julie did. The composition on this is really nice. Um, now, generally, we're told to do rules of thirds, you know, where you're going to cut the sky in third or the ground in a third. But what she's done here is cut it in the middle. But I see the rule of thirds here with the texture and the leading lines going into the photo. I really like this. It's different. It's unusual. And um, I think it's, it's pretty neat. This works. Um, there's another shot here. This is nice. And we've got this cool old building. Oh, man, when I see that, you know what I want to do? I want to get in here and I want to start dodging and burning. Let's go in. Let's open this. This is a JPEG. All right, so we're going to do all of this in Photoshop this time. We could open it in Camera Raw if we wanted. In fact, why don't we just do some basic adjustments? We're going to choose Filter, Camera Raw, and we'll do our overall adjustments. Then we'll go into Photoshop for the rest of it. First thing I want to do is I see this bright sky. First thing I want to do is recover those highlights. Push that all the way to the left. And look at that. We get some detail. Now, had this been a RAW file, we'd be able to recover even more, but that's okay. Let's take that down just a little bit. Open up those shadows just a smidge. Give a little push on the whites. So what we're doing here is we're just setting our overall tones. I'm gonna reduce the contrast because we can add contrast later. It's very easy to add contrast just with a curves adjustment. So in fact, why don't we do that here? There's a curves adjustment here. If we want to add the contrast back in, pull it down and then pull it up. But what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to take this away because the area I'm looking for is this building. So let's grab this little target here and we want to brighten this up. So I'm just going to click and drag up. And notice how it's just hitting those tones on the area that I'm clicking on. Now, the reason I did it this way is because I'm trying to keep bring back some of this detail here in the clouds. And notice we've got these clouds are nice and dark. So we can see them there, it's not blown out. So let's click OK. And if we look at this before, and we can see after, now we're starting to get some detail here and our clouds and it's starting to show overall. So one of the things I like to do is if I see an area where it's too bright or an area it's too dark, I like to bring back the detail there. I like to open that up so we can see the detail and sometimes reduce the contrast, which is what we've got here. Because contrast is a problem. Like people do too much contrast on their photos. So now what we're going to do is some dodging and burning. So let's go to our layers panel here and I'll just drag it up. Let me reset this workspace. I'm just going to go here and just choose to reset that. Okay, that's much better. It's too many panels in there. <laughs> and why don't we just create a new adjustment layer and I'm going to hold down the Alt key. That would be the Option key as I click the new layer. And this gives me the options. And I'm just going to call this dark. And I'm going to change this blending mode to overlay blending mode. And click OK. So now we've got a dark area, which is why we can add, you know, we can add our shadows with this. And so why don't we start with our shadows? Before I do, I'm going to duplicate this layer. You can drag it into the new layer icon or hit Control J or Command J and we'll make that light. So we're going to paint with light there. So this is going to be our lighter and our darker. And if you guys are familiar with my style, if you've watched a few of these, I love to do dodging and burning. So we're going to choose dark and let's grab a brush. So let's hit the B key for brush. And if some of you have just joined us, welcome. We're just about to start dodging and burning this particular image. And uh, just to let you guys know, the replays 
will be uh, available. YouTube puts them up about 15 minutes after we finish, so the entire session will be replayed if you missed it, um, or you want to go back and rewatch it. Also, just do me a favor while you're here, hit that like button. Because if you hit that like button, what it does is it boosts us in the algorithm and lets more people know that we're doing the live stream. So that's the thumbs up. Just tap that right now if you don't mind. And also, if you are not a subscriber to Photoshop Cafe, you'll see a subscribe button. Just tap that and become a subscriber. All right, let's continue with this now. And I'm going to do dark. Oh, one more thing I do want to mention is we're not going to be doing this for the next two weeks because we've got Adobe Max in two weeks time and next week I'm doing Adobe Live. Um, so make sure you're on our mailing list at photoshopcafe.com. Join our list and then I'll let you know the dates and times for all those things. And also I'll let you know, you know, before we do each live stream, I'll send you that reminder because YouTube doesn't send the reminders anymore. So if you want to be reminded, make sure you, um, you do that. All right, so we're going to add some shadow and I'm just going to just enhance what's already here. Well, that's a little much. Let's select our brush there. Make sure we've got our hardness all the way down. And let's take our flow down to 10. Shift 1 will adjust the flow. And if it's still too dark, take it a little lower. Maybe I'm going to take this down about 8. Now, one of the things I might do, you know, if I'm trying to get this really good, is I'll select these areas. And it gives a different look. Let me show you here. If you get the object selection tool and maybe you want to grab that chimney. Oh, got to get out to the layer itself. Select it. There we go. We can select that chimney. See what we're doing there? And then when we go up under darks, um, we're just painting it now. And then what it's doing is it's protecting that edge and giving us that. And it still feels a little much. Let's grab the brush settings here. And I'm using a Wacom tablet. Uh, so I can go down here and choose transfer, set opacity to pen pressure. If you're using a mouse, maybe drop that opacity down about seven or even six. And it just enables you to be a little bit more subtle. So now what I'm doing is I'm just painting here. I'm increasing that shadow around that area. Control D turns off that selection and see how it just isolates that selection. Um, if you do it free freestyle here without the selections, which I very often do, um, what that would do is it would create um, just softer edges and it can give it a more painterly look. But I'm just going to undo this for a second because I'm noticing something that's not quite looking right to me. And that's I'm looking at this building. I see that the light is actually coming from this side. Because see how this is brighter than there? So this is the light section. So the shadow is going to be falling off the other way. So that means that I wouldn't want to be painting on this front facing area unless it was in shade, which it could be because of the building. Um, but for your shadow, you're going to be kind of going in more these areas. So the light hits and then the shadows are on the other side there. So you could be picking up shadows like on the backs of the trees, things like that. And this will add some dimension to the trees. You'll see this in a sec. And you know, in the real world, if I'm doing this, not just demoing, I would make a selection around this tree quickly, you know, using this. Let me show you. Go around there um, on the actual tree layer. There we go. So I would do that and then that would help, you know, so I'm not painting into the sky and I'm putting those shadows on the other side. You'll watch, you'll see what will happen soon. Sometimes I get you know, just I'm just trying to do this quickly, so I'll do it. And I'm overdoing this, which is fine, just for the demo so you guys can see what's going on. And see how I'm just adding some shade there, and I might put a little bit back there and separate some of these areas, maybe a little shadow in here, which makes it just it's adding that dimension because this area is sticking up. Now, it's going to look a little funny when I just add the shadow. Once I add the highlight, then things are really going to just kind of kicked into gear so I'm adding a little shadow there just to add some drama some some on that side of the tree now remember I would have selected this tree as I, as I showed you guys but I'm not going to do it here just for the sake of time and see what I'm doing is I'm deepening those shadows and this is going to add depth and dimension to the photo all right so let's go to the lights now this is where we're going to see a big difference flip it around now we're using the highlights 
And I am going to select this tree just so you can just kind of get an idea of what would happen. With this object selection, go around the tree, it's selected, let's Alt or Option to take away from there. Here we go, it's on the trunk. Let's hit the lights, brush, notice we're on a separate layer, and I can paint on the front facing parts of here. So what we're doing is we're adding some dimension here. Um, and we're going here. If you guys haven't done this technique before, it's definitely going to give you not just dramatic results, but it's also just fun. And I'm going to go in here and lighten that up because I should have. Maybe even go in the area that, it, oh, turn off the selection first. Because if you try to paint on something that's selected, not much is going to happen. And see what I'm doing is I'm brightening that up even. And let's hit that front face here. That roof might get a little bit, but watch what's happening on these trees. And this is the part I really enjoy is adding the light. Because we're, we're painting with light right now. Same with this. Watch this. I'll put a little bit on here. You know, some of these might be getting a little bit. But let's focus on some of these other areas. Like maybe just a little bit kissing the top of those. All right. So let's have a look and see what's happening. If we go here and we do this before and there's after. Now, watch this tree. Look at the tree here. Before, after. See how it adds depth and dimension and makes things look more rounded? Now, it's a little much, like I said, but we can go in and we can reduce the opacity. So let's take those darks and we just roll them in a little bit. Now it's at 41%. Look at that tree. Before, after. Look at that. Flat, rounded, dimension. So, um, you know, so this is really useful for, you know, a lot of different things, you know, just to give more depth. It also creates separation between different objects. And of course, you know, if we wanted, we could also use it for darkening the sky. So with dark turned on, you could use, just choose a huge brush here and just start to make sure we get the right setting with black. And then you can just start to darken up. See what we're doing? We're just darkening up that sky. Now, of course, you would make a selection around it. There we go, before and after. See how it's, it's working nicely. And I'll show you how you would make that selection. You would just go here, choose select, color range. Click in the sky there. Adjust that fuzziness. Click OK. And that is more or less, you know, getting you that area of the sky. And then we hit dark. Let's do that just to show you. Make that brush big. I'm going to go too much just so you guys can see. So I'm painting with black. And we're just darkening that up. That flow, maybe turn up a little bit more. Uh, dark, turn up. Ah, we're down to 40%, that's why. All right, and see what we're doing. We're just going really hardcore here, just darkening the sky. Control D to turn that off. And, you know, it's a little much. So what would you do? You would just go in here and you would just fix this. Now let's just create a mask. Now if I'd add 50% gray in here instead of painting this on transparent, I would just paint with 50% gray to fade it out. But I can also just fade it out here. So let's just do that there. We're just fading it out on the horizon line a little bit because we got a little carried away. And see what we're doing is now we're adding this very, very dark dramatic sky. And if we look at that before and after, and of course the before photo was, um, you know, very, very bright before we did any other the other adjustments there. Um, so um, I think we're pretty much getting there as far as time. So don't forget guys, in two weeks, um, next week, I'll be on Adobe live stream next and that will be on Wednesday and Thursday. That's at Adobe's Behance. I'll be on at 9.30 a.m. for an hour and a half next Wednesday and Thursday. So check that out. Um, and or or you could just go to YouTube. It's also on the Adobe uh, YouTube channel on Adobe uh, Creative Cloud or Adobe Creative uh, Adobe Live, I think. Um, 
and that'll be on. Um, and then I'll be doing design cuts at 11 a.m. on Friday. This is all Pacific time. I'll be doing a little demo with those guys. Uh, check that out. And then the following week is Adobe Max. So I'll be on at Tuesday the 20th at 3 p.m. Wednesday the 21st, 3.30. And then on Thursday at 2.30. So go to Adobe Max. And you can just Google Adobe Max and find it. Um, and then just go there and sign up for my class. My class is beginning compositing inside of Photoshop. So it's a three-parter. Um, love to have you guys join us. And then we'll be back on the 29th of October, which is one, two, three weeks from now. We'll be back at 1 p.m. for season two of Live from Lockdown. So I hope you guys are enjoying it. Now, if you want to hang out for LFL Afterglow, um, just hang out and we are going to, um, yeah, we're going to hang out, do questions and answers and all that. But for everybody else, thanks for watching. Uh, do me a favor. If you like this, hit that like button. Don't forget to drop a comment. Even though the live chat is not here, the comment section is open. Let me know if you learned anything in here and what you'd like to see in a future, um, when we come back for this, you know, what you'd like to learn. And uh, don't forget, if you haven't subscribed yet to Photoshop Cafe, smash the like button into dust. And to submit your photos for Fix My Photo, go to fixmyphoto.net and upload your raw files.